Welcome to Norse Mythology, the unofficial guide. It's unofficial because I'm neither a credentialed academic nor a time-traveling medieval Norse pagan, but I deal with this material directly from the sources, interpreted through the lens of the experts and their opinions. If you're looking for depth and detail in a simple and accessible way, then you're in the right place. Reider var tha vingthor, er han vaknadi, och sins hammers of saknadi, skegna matrista skorna mat duja, red jardar bur, um mat revask. Unless you are really familiar with Old Norse poetry, you probably didn't notice that the stanza I just read contained a problem. The problem is that the very first word of the very first half line breaks an alliteration rule that goes along with this particular poetic meter, which is called fornurdeslog. That half line again is reider varthal vingthor. It tries to alliterate an R word, reider, with a V word, vingthor. And then these two words are supposed to go on to alliterate with another V word at the end of the line, vaknadi. The R word doesn't belong. We should have had all V words. So why do we have reider? I've mentioned a couple of times on this show that much of what is in the Poetic Edda can be linguistically dated to having been composed during the pagan period. And if you've ever wondered how that works, this is actually a classic example. Reider is cognate with the English word wrath, as in angry or furious. They both have the same Proto-Germanic origin, and both mean pretty much the exact same thing. Wrath is kind of an outdated word these days, but you'll notice that even though we pronounce it as though it begins with an R, it's actually one of those words that begins with a W, like wrong or written. And prior to the beginning of the 11th century, when Iceland converted to Christianity, reyder likewise began with a V, vreyder. So when we see 13th century scribes writing down poetry that tries to alliterate R words like this with V words, there's a good chance the poem itself is a lot older than the scribes writing it down. Whoever originally composed it probably pronounced all of these words with a V, and then a few hundred years later, the word sounds like it begins with an R, and people are writing it down the way it sounds. If you think hard enough about this, you might start to wonder whether poets in the 13th century could have assumed that in earlier times, V was allowed to alliterate with R, and then tried to recreate that style in their own work on purpose, to try and give it an older feel. It's a question the academic community has asked in the past. However, a study by Hauker Thorgersen in 2017 found no evidence of this happening in works that are provably younger, so it looks like this is still a decent tool for dating poetry. There is a lot more that goes into dating Eddic poetry, of course. This is just one of the simplest examples. But I bring it up here because the poem we're going to talk about today, Thrymskvida, is notoriously hard to date. There are reasons why we might think it's a later Christian-era poem, and there are reasons to think it might be much older. It contains VR alliteration in the very first stanza, but a later stanza also tries to alliterate Reider with some words that start with F, which is very confusing and throws everything back up into the air again. But the subject matter of the poem is the theft and recovery of the Thunder God's weapon, which is certainly an ancient motif. Here's stanza one again in English, quote, Furious was Thor when he awoke and missed his hammer. He shook his beard. He tossed his hair to and fro. Earth's sun began to grope about. End quote. The reason for my focus on the dating here is that Thrymskvida is sort of unique among Eddic poems. It's a comedy, for one, and it makes heavy use of things like repetition and, as Lindau puts it, juxtaposition of solemn language and incongruous situations, which suggests a satire that may be difficult to ascribe to the Viking Age. Specifically, Lindau thinks what we have here is a late reworking of earlier material. But Thrymskvida is also a poem where social relationships are all turned upside down and backward, at least according to the Norse mindset. And it requires the reader to have a basic understanding of its characters and their reputations, as well as of basic behavioral expectations in Norse society in order to fully comprehend it. It deals heavily with gender taboos and even plays with gender linguistically a little bit, which is really fascinating. It's also one of three surviving stories where Loki transforms himself into a woman. But it doesn't do a whole lot of good to talk forever about a story without actually telling the story. So here it is. Thor wakes up 
and discovers that his legendary hammer, the one that he uses to crush the skulls of the Jotnar, the one he uses to resurrect his goats, the one he uses to defend the home of the gods, the one he uses to protect and avenge his worshippers in Midgardr, is gone. And he is mad. The first person Thor tells is Loki, but he doesn't accuse Loki of stealing it. It comes across in the poem a lot more like, Hey, Loki, nobody knows about this yet, but we have a problem. Somebody stole my hammer. And so Loki takes Thor to visit Freya. And here we finally start getting some dialogue from the Jotnar's most coveted goddess. Thor and Loki ask her if they can borrow her feather covering to go searching for the hammer. This feather covering, whether it's a shirt or a cloak or some other kind of clothing, isn't super clear. But it's an aspect of Freya's that allows her to fly and seems like it might be related to her possible role as a Valkyrie a woman with the job of choosing which warriors will die in battle. Another poem, called Volundarkvida, features three other characters explicitly called Valkyries, all of whom have something similar called swan coverings, and are described as being able to fly. Grimness Small Stanza 14 tells us that Freya chooses half the slain who die each day in battle, and the Prosetta adds to this by telling us that she does this when she rides into battle. There's a lot about her that looks very Valkyrie-esque. Freya appears to understand the gravity of the missing hammer situation. Her response is, quote, I'd give it to you even if it were made of gold. I'd lend it to you even if it were made of silver, end quote. Loki dons the feather covering at this point and blasts off to Jotunheimr with the feathers whistling in the air. When he arrives, he finds, sitting on a grave mound, a lord among Thursar, or perhaps the lord among Thursar, named Thrymr. Thursar, of course, is just being used here as a synonym for Jotnar, and Thrymer is currently crafting some golden dog collars and trimming his horse's manes. He sees Loki approaching and calls out basically, Oh, hey, what brings you around these parts? What's the news among the Asir and the elves? As if he doesn't already know. Bad news, Loki replies, and then immediately gets down to business, seeming to have already correctly guessed exactly what's happened to Mjolnir. Have you hidden Thor's hammer, he presses. Thrymer readily admits to having hidden the hammer somewhere eight leagues under the earth and explains that the only way anyone is ever going to get it back from him is by trading him Freya's hand in marriage for it. Loki immediately blasts back off towards Osgarther, again with his feathers whistling in the wind. And before he can even land, he is met by Thor, who starts demanding to know what he's found while he's still in the air. Tails often escape the sitting man, Thor says, and the man lying down barks out lies. So Loki replies with the bad news from Thrymmer. Getting the hammer back is going to mean trading Freya for it. Thor, however, doesn't seem to have a problem with this exchange at all. And we can only guess why. Maybe it's because he understands that retrieving the hammer is more important than anything else. Maybe it's because he intends to just kill Thrymmer immediately upon retrieving the hammer, in which case he'd be able to return home with both Freya and Mjolnir intact. We don't know for sure. But in any case, Thor and Loki travel back to Freya's hall. And when they arrive, Thor drops the proverbial bomb. Go put on a bridal headdress, Freya, he says, because you and me, we're driving to Jotunheimr. The Old Norse phrase that Thor actually speaks here is Vit skulum akatvau i Jotunheimr, which means literally, we too will drive to Jotunheimr. The word used for the number two here is tvau, which is a specific conjugation of that word implying a mixed-gendered group of two. Thor is male. Freya is female, so the word we use for the two of them is tvau. This may seem like a ridiculous point to bring up, but it's important later on, so keep it in mind. Freya responds by snorting in an indignant rage. She snorts so powerfully, in fact, that the whole hall trembles and her necklace falls off. And she says, If I let you wed me to a Jotun, it'll make me look like the most man-crazed woman there is. And this is actually a very serious problem for a Norse woman. In a previous episode, we talked about the concept of the Niðingar and how if a person behaves in a way that society sees as wrong, it can result in extreme social stigma. There's also a very serious form of Niðh in Norse society called Ergi. Most of the time when we see this word show up, we translate it to unmanliness because it's usually being used in the context of a man behaving in a way that society deems as improper for a male. In a worst case, according to the Norse mindset, this would mean behaving as a coward or assuming the passive role in a homosexual encounter. But according to the paper Everybody Cites by Folke Strum, even when that isn't what's literally occurred, 
The accusation of ergi still appears to carry an implicit connotation of the same thing. If a man performed seder, for example, he may not literally be engaging in cowardice or homosexuality, but through an accusation of ergi, he becomes viewed essentially as that type of person. But women can be accused of ergi as well, and in the context of a woman, it usually refers to sexual promiscuity. Being accused of ergi was so incredibly serious in Norse society that if somebody accused you of it, you would often have a legal right to kill them just for saying it. And the reason why is that an arger person, that is, a person who exhibits ergi, is going to become a social pariah at best, and may even be punished by law as well, depending on the circumstances. According to Strum, quote, no other Norse word was able to provoke such violent feelings and reactions, end quote. Freya's refusal to be married to Thrymmer in this poem is essentially an attempt to avoid accusations of ergi, which is actually sort of ironic given the way she's treated throughout the source material, specifically as a woman who does kinda sleep with everyone. I don't think it's a stretch to imagine that a Norse person might have chuckled a little bit upon hearing Freya act like she's worried about this part of her reputation. But at the same time, every Norse woman would have been keenly aware of how important it was to avoid such accusations. So, with Freya refusing to be married off, all the gods and goddesses meet in council to try and figure out a solution. Heimdallr speaks up, and his voice matters because we learn here that he can see the future, quote, like other Vanir, end quote, whatever that's supposed to mean. And he proposes a bold suggestion. Let's dress Thor up like Freya, complete with a bridal headdress, jingling keys, Freya's famous necklace, a wedding dress, and a briosti breitha stena, upon his breast, broad stones, which might refer to some kind of jewels, or might be some kind of hilariously uncomfortable bra stuffing, according to Lindau. If Heimdallr can see the future, then his plan has a pretty good chance of success, if you ask me. But Thor doesn't like this idea. If I let you tie a headdress on me, he complains, the Asir will call me Arger. Arger, of course, is the adjective form of Ergi. Thor doesn't want to do this because he's the epitome of the Norse idea of manliness, and the idea of him dressing up as a woman is not only silly, it's self-destructive. But this is bigger than the destruction of Thor's reputation. Loki chimes in here and tells Thor to be quiet. If they don't do something to get the hammer back soon, the Jotnar are going to be overrunning all of Osgarther, and so Heimdallr's plan is carried out. Note the way the poet makes use of callbacks to previous structures here. Earlier, Thor said to Freya, tie a bridal headdress on yourself, and her response is that she doesn't want to be thought of as man-crazed, the feminine definition of Arger. And now here, Heimdallr says, let's tie a bridal headdress on Thor, and his response is that he doesn't want to be called Arger. Once Thor is fully decked out in drag, Loki offers to accompany Thor to Jotunheimr in the form of a handmaid, and quote, we too shall drive to Jotunheimr, vitskulum aka tvau i Jotunheimr. He repeats the exact same words to Thor that Thor originally spoke to Freya, including the mixed-gendered conjugation of the word two. The two of them, Thor and Loki, one male and one female, will drive to Jotunheimr. What's fascinating about this little word is all the layers it adds to the situation. Loki speaks this sentence while still in male form. So, is it intended to refer to himself as the future female on the drive to Jotunheimr? or as an insult to Thor as the present female in the wedding dress. The ambiguity is probably deliberate. It rubs salt in Thor's wound of being forced to sacrifice his masculinity, references Loki's canonical associations with Ergi, creates a clever poetic callback, and is just great dialogue that is totally lost in the English translation. And so at some point, Loki shapeshifts into the form of an actual woman, Thor's goats are harnessed up to his chariot, and the two of them race off towards Jotunheimr. Thor being Thor, this journey causes the mountains to split apart and the earth to catch fire in their wake. And perhaps in response to all the commotion outside, Thrymmer begins preparing for the wedding. He even waxes poetic about all the riches he possesses and how the only thing he still lacks is Freya. And then... Big, bulky, air quotes Freya arrives with handmaid in tow early that evening. Lindau explains that the big joke here is that this plan really shouldn't work. Wedding dress or not, Thor is still Thor, and as the events progress, 
It's really only the stupidity of the Jotnar that prevents them from catching on, as Thor makes essentially no attempt at all to behave like a woman. And this is all part of the narrative fun. As dinner is served, Thor proceeds to devour an entire ox, eight salmon, all the dainties meant for the women, and three full casks of mead. Lindau asserts that in a context like this, women are supposed to be serving the alcohol but not drinking it, and so Thor has, quote, already revealed his identity in a way that turns on the gendered falsehood of his disguise, end quote. And yet, Thrymmer's response is to be perplexed. He's just sort of like, wow, I've never seen a girl eat and drink like that before, because of course he hasn't, because of course they don't. So it's up to Loki to explain it away. The poet presents it in these words, quote, The very shrewd maid sat before him. She found an answer to the giant's speech. Freya ate nothing for eight nights. So madly eager was she to come to giant land, end quote. I mentioned before how there's a claim floating around the internet that Loki uses female pronouns when he shapeshifts into female form. And I also called that claim a little misleading. This is a prime example. In Larrington's translation, the stanza opens by focusing in on what it describes as a shrewd maid, and then uses the pronoun she to refer back to the maid later in the sentence. However, this is actually an insertion placed there by the translator. The original Old Norse version avoids using pronouns while referring to Loki here entirely. The words are, Sat in Olsnotra ombot fir er orde fan vid jotunsmali. And here's how that would shake out literally word for word in English, as close as we can get to word for word. Sat the all clever servant before, when words did find against Jotun's speech. Obviously, English doesn't really work this way, but you can get away with avoiding lots of little clarifier words in Old Norse because of the way the grammar works. With that said, all the words being used here are in feminine form. An ombolt is a female servant and the adjective meaning clever, snotra, that goes along with it, appears in a feminine declension. Loki has literally taken on the form of a woman here, specifically a serving maid, as opposed to just being in disguise. And the Old Norse grammar rules require adjectives describing a feminine noun like this to be in feminine form themselves. Context, as always, is key. Loki also calls Thor by the female pronoun hon in this stanza. However, contextually, this is because Thor is in disguise and is trying to pass for a woman. It wouldn't make a lot of sense for both grammatical and narrative reasons here to say something like, yeah, Thrymmer, your new bride is hungry because he hasn't eaten for eight days. It's wrong in Old Norse grammatically, and it would give away the ruse. There's actually a lot more we could say about Loki and gender. I mean, he is a woman right now, but we'll have to save that for another episode. For now, hopefully this helps provide a little insight into where some of these ideas are coming from, and the types of things we need to look at to properly understand what the authors intended. Loki's explanation for Thor Freya's appetite satisfies Thrymmer, and he decides to bend down under his bride-to-be's headdress to try and steal a little kiss. But as soon as he does, he is confronted with Thor's legendary fierce and fiery gaze. He springs backward in shock and says, why are Freya's eyes so terrifying? It seems to me fire is burning from them. But the very shrewd maid sat before him and found an answer to the Elton speech. Oh, well, you know, that's just because she hasn't slept for eight nights, because she was so madly eager to get here. Imagining this scene is pretty hilarious. Thor so far has stayed quiet, but he's also making no attempt at all to behave like a woman, regardless of the bridal attire. I imagine him just thunderously crashing down at Thrymmer's Hall with all these cracked mountains and a path of flames behind him, just kind of stomping around into the hall and then shoveling all the food into his face with his rough working man hands and glaring at Thrymmer with murder in his eyes when he gets too close. And then dainty, sweet female Loki is explaining everything away like, oh, she just hasn't eaten in a while and she just hasn't slept in a while. And Thrymmer the whole time is just sort of like, well... This isn't really what I was expecting, but I'm into it. At this point, Thrymmer's sister comes in and, quote, dared to ask for a gift from the bride, end quote. She tells disguised Thor that if he wants to earn her love and favor as a sister-in-law, he should give her the golden arm rings he's wearing. We are not told whether Thor would have handed them over because at this point, the interaction is interrupted by Thrymmer, who is growing impatient and wants to get on with the wedding. He calls for Thor's hammer to be brought in and laid on Thor's knees to, quote, sanctify the bride and, quote, consecrate us together by the hand of Vor. 
This piece is interesting because it portrays the Jotnar as engaging in a wedding ritual that, for all we know, could have been to some degree recognizable to Norse people. We actually have no real descriptions of wedding rituals from the Norse period written down, and so this imagery of Thor's hammer being invoked to consecrate the bride in some way causes the mind to run wild. The symbolism here has been interpreted in a few different ways. There's the actual claim Thrymmer makes here that it ought to sanctify the bride, in which case we might want to think of the hammer as a fertility symbol. On the other hand, placing Thor's hammer directly into his lap could also be thought of as not so subtly illustrating Thor's masculinity finally being returned to him, in the form of a phallic symbol being placed back where it had symbolically been removed. Margaret Clooney's Ross notes that the theft of Thor's hammer amounts to a symbolic emasculation, making him symbolically Arger, and that this symbolic condition extends to the whole society of the Asir, because their primary means of defending themselves against the Jotnar, who consistently want to steal their women, has been taken away. It is essentially a threat to the entire structure of divine society, and by extension, to human society as well. Thrymmer even calls upon an Asir goddess here named Vor which is awfully strange behavior coming from a Jotun, at least at face value. Vor's name has been glossed as both Pledge and Beloved by different scholars. Pledge works pretty well, though, given Snorri's explanation in the Prose Edda that Vor is a goddess who listens to oaths and private agreements that men and women make with each other, and then punishes people who break those oaths. He tells us that for this reason, these types of contracts are called Varar, so that makes us wonder if the nature of her invocation here reflects something that might have commonly been done in real pagan weddings. Regardless of whatever ritual information we can read from this poem, suddenly Thor's hammer is back in his own possession, and we are told that his heart laughs in his chest upon recognizing it. We unfortunately do not get a lot more descriptive detail about this moment, though, which is really disappointing because it ought to be so incredibly climactic. For instance, there's no reaction from Thrymmer where we see him finally realizing Thor is not Freya. But maybe that's because he doesn't even have time to react. Thor kills Thrymmer pretty much immediately and at least maims everyone else in attendance. He also kills Thrymmer's sister, who had demanded a gift from him just moments before. Quote, striking she got instead of shillings and hammer blows instead of heaps of rings, end quote. And so, we are told, Odin's son got his hammer back. This formula where Thor is described as giving a Jotun a proverbial gift of death rather than the gift they've been asking for also shows up in the Prose Edda account of Sleipnir's birth. The Jotun building the wall around Osgarther is prevented from completing the job on time and therefore has to forfeit his payment. He flies into a Jotun's rage and Thor is called upon to take care of the problem. The way it's described is that Thor pays the builder with a crushing blow to the head. Thrymskvida is an interesting poem for a lot of reasons, though, apart from just repeated themes, not least of which is that it shows us how, even though Norse gender roles were extremely rigid and binary in daily life, as we see especially in places like sagas and ancient law codes, the poets were not beyond playing with gender linguistically, deliberately introducing ambiguity and using it in some subtle and some not-so-subtle symbolic ways. Knowing that this happens lets us know that we can be on the lookout for it elsewhere, but it also helps us properly interpret moments where we don't see it happening. In this case, some taboo behavior is necessary for the preservation of life as we know it. It's actually a brilliant theme in the context of a society that is sort of obsessed with maintaining this type of structure, and I imagine it must have been a pretty philosophical conversation starter apart from just a funny story. If you're the average manly Norse man, Surely you would never be caught dead in a dress. It would destroy you. But what if the lives of your family or the fate of your village was at stake, and the only way to save everyone was to sacrifice your masculinity to do it, maybe in the worst way? Would you do it? I imagine Norse people sitting around and talking about things like this. It's the theme of Thrymskvida, and it's exactly what Thor does in that poem. But... It's not without complaining, and it's not without worrying about his reputation, and it's not without finding a way to reclaim his masculinity when it's all over and done with. And Loki, agent of chaos that he is, seems to revel in the whole thing. Me, I just revel in deciphering the mythology and trying my best to understand it the way its ancient audiences would have. So let's try and do more of that together next time on Norse Mythology, The Unofficial Guide. 
Sources for this episode include Negative Reciprocity by Margaret Clooney's Ross in Prolonged Echoes, Volume 1, 1994. Neith, Ergi, and Old Norse Moral Attitudes by Folke Strum, 1974. Paganism at Home, Pre-Christian Private Praxis and Household Religion in the Iron Age North by Luke John Murphy, 2018. The Dating of Vedic Poetry, Evidence from Alliteration by Halker Thor Gerson, 2017. Trumskvida, Myth and Mythology by John Lindau, 1997. The Poetic Edda, translated by Caroline Larrington, 2014. And the Prose Edda, translated by Anthony Falks, 1995.